good afternoon. So we start this uh, afternoon session with uh, Claude Yu, talking about uh, integrated markets and uh, conservation of some of these things. Okay. Well, so. Okay, so hello everybody. Um, this talk is indeed about well, all the radical kinematics, Raymond Spears, and we have already many times this morning many of these concepts, and the talk is actually related to many of the talks that we have this morning, as you will see. But before getting there, um, just a few words of introduction that I can be very, very brief to this <coughs> on this table, and it's a very nice introduction to all of the things that I refer to on this slide, and also Benjamin. So, I guess we all agree that Data Handling Sport is kind of our favorite playground to study scattering amplitudes. Why? Well, remember the talk to Marcus and Benjamin this morning. We understand now a lot of things in that theory that we don't really understand in other theories, like Marcus talked about cluster algebra structure that underlies scattering amplitudes in the theory which also is related to the opinions of iterated integrals, but we'll come back to that. And then we also talked about collinear of E, and the fact that these building blocks, these tangible transitions, and the spectrum of the explication of the flux group can come from the <coughs> So there's, if you want, the mathematical side of understand, and also the way the dynamics is important. And if you combine all of this, as you will hear from Lance on Wednesday, I think, this becomes very powerful. This has led to this hexagon bootstrap program, which has allowed people to get very high orders for the hexagon amplitudes, MHV and next MHV. And also, as Marcus mentioned this morning, people think now about hexagon bootstraps. So that's very nice. Question? Yeah? yeah? Would you have any insight why iterated integrals appear? Um, in general? Some, some general. In general, I don't know, you will see why it is here now in general. I mean, I can't try to make philosophical statements, but if you ask me for a mathematical proof, I wouldn't be able to give you one. You can probably see it from... Uh, Not for a proof, but for a reason. For a reason. Physical reason, I, I don't know. And look, for example, at differential equations for loop integrals, and you see that they have a structure that lead to this, but the physical reason or the mathematical proof, I would say, I, I don't know. Okay, so, as I said, well, all this was very successful for six and seven points. Marcus will talk about it, Marcus talked about it this morning. But also, Marcus already mentioned this morning that there's kind of a phase transition. If you go beyond eight points, this cluster R becomes infinite. The expect non collision function appears, so basically we have not a lot of data beyond seven points. Not to say now. So for a few two dimensional kinematics. And well, what this talk is about, it's basically to show you an example of where these mathematical structures act kind of in harmony. So Marcus said that in general we don't understand why the cluster of algebra appears or what is the meaning of it. Here you see, well, you see the case where all the structures act as one, act in harmony. And the result will be, well, it will only be the limit of the amplitude, but the result is that we can go to high numbers of loops and legs for very complicated statistical configurations. So what is this limit? Well, you may have guessed it, the multi ledger limit. <laughs> In this outline of the talk, I will just briefly introduce multi-reactive kinematics, but then we have already done it this morning. And then I will talk about how this is connected to the geometry of the modular space of Riemann series with marked points, and how you can get MHV amplitudes and also non-MHV amplitudes out of that. So, Benjamin already introduced multi-reactive kinematics as being the limit where particles are widely subject in mobility. Or equivalently, there's a hierarchy among the outgoing plus like coordinates. So 
particle 1 to n low n, if you produce particle 3 to n, and the like the dust coordinates are ordered, ordered in this way, but the transverse components are considered complexified all of the same size. So that's the limit I want to talk about. And, well, since and take a limit on the Lightning plus coordinates, that means that basically all the non-trivial stuff is going to happen in the transverse plane. In the transverse plane where the transverse momentum is. Yeah. And since n equals 4 is dual conformal invariant, that means that, well, that dual conformal invariants will leave kind of an imprint in the transverse plane, which means that they can represent the transverse plane in the following way. So this x is here, which are two dimensional coordinates in this transverse plane. <coughs> this dashed lines here you should consider as being or formal to the plane. So those are the incoming momentum. You have the beam axis, the z direction, and then f to this direction. So my dual coordinates here have an imprint in the transverse plane, and so dual conformal invariance tells me that it should get functions of, of spaces in this transverse plane. <coughs> One thing which you can note from here, which will be important later on, is that well, the random kinematics corresponds with more than rapidity. So the particles are widely separated at an angle, roughly speaking. And therefore, you cannot have collinear singularities. They are well separated. So the only singularities you can get are soft singularities. If one of the particles in the momentum is uh, defined state soft, and that you can easily convince yourself corresponds to two neighboring points becoming equal. Yeah. Remember that, I will come back. So, what happens in the random limit? Well, and again, very quick because then we introduced already. So, if you take the random limit in the Euclidean region, nothing interesting happens. But if you first analytically continue the function to some mountainous region, I will not be more precise, and then you take the limit, the result doesn't vanish. But you can write down some kind of all robust formula, which is shown here, which is actually the same as what Ben showed this morning. Maybe written in a slightly different way, but it's essentially the same formula. And the building blocks in here are, I right, see here, this is tau is some quantity that goes to zero in the limit. So you get large logarithms, all over order, up and constant a. E is the BFKL eigenvalue, which also did in the talk this morning. But I'm only working at leading order in the eigenvalue, which is leading over everything up here, see. Then I have impact factors and some transmission blocks, which you could think of in the vertices in which you emit particles of this T channel level. Okay? And what I want to do is, I'm not going to do final coupling, but I want to expand the coupling. So I do determinative expansion. I get at each order, I get large logs, because tau goes to zero. And what I'm interested in is these perturbative coefficients that multiply the logs, and I'm going to label them by, well, the powers of the logs and the heuristic configuration. Okay. And note that the heuristics just enter here the second line, the mission vertices, while the powers of the logs are, they come from here. So come back here. Okay? So, of course, we were not the first to do it, this limit. Actually, six point is effectively completely known. At six points, we completely know what the uh, uh, red limit of the arm <coughs> is for, so MHV and XMHV. And what people have observed is that there's a class of functions that allows you to write down the answer to six point arm to this limit, which is a class of only logarithms only, harmonic, well, also important, but the important point is that they were single valued. They're a combination of polylogs without branch cuts. People also looked at um, it was a little bit more legs, but that was restricted to two loops that was starting from a small symbol and then taking the limit. An interesting point was that people ob uh, observed is that if you look at the seven point answer, you get the sum of two six point amplitudes. If you look at eight point in multi-edge kinematics, you get the sum of three six point amplitudes. Yeah, which is very suggestive. And so the aim of this talk is that we basically want to go into the general level of this. We will find what is the general meaning of single value, that's an appear to six points. We will find what is the meaning of this factorization. And the way we will find it is through some geometry. Yeah, 
So, yeah. Good. So, what is this MZ1? Well, I didn't know that he appeared in some of the talks this morning on the scattering equation. This is a model space of Riemann spheres with n marked points. Another way of saying it's called the modular space of configuration of points that appear uh, on the Riemann sphere. Remember that in Marcus's talk there was this comp NP3, this is comp NP1. And in other words, it's all configuration of putting points on the sphere. What do the symmetries of the sphere with the Mobius transformations? So, what has this to do with radical kinematics? Well, this is a sphere. And let me decompactify the sphere, I get a plane. That is my transverse plane. And in the kinematics, we have the transverse plane with dual coordinates on it. So that corresponds, literally, kinematics corresponds to putting n minus 2 points, n minus 2 because they have the two incoming particles, on the plane or equivalent on the sphere. The first question you can ask is, okay, what is the dimension of this space? Well, it's the number of ways of putting any points on the sphere and the symmetries of the sphere. Uh, the Möbius group is three-dimensional, so the dimension is n minus two. That tells immediately that, well, if the coordinates on the space will be n minus three cos ranges. And little n is capital n minus two, so capital n minus five. Then those are the signs of the cos ranges that we had from the conformal invariants in the transverse space. So they have nothing but coordinates when they have to The singularities of the space should be when, well, geometry generates. So how does the geometry of points on the sphere degenerate? Well, the two points coincide, because then it's not n points, it's only n minus one points. Okay? And remember that I said the singularities in this limit are soft, and soft corresponds to two points becoming equal. So you see that the right geometry Arises. Now, this is very kinematical. Is there a more vigorous way of seeing this? Yes. So, you see this very same picture in Marcus' talk this morning. It's the cluster algebra associated to um, G4n, which describes configurations of n points in CB3. And now, well, let's start from this and let's take the regular limit and do that. When you do that, the following thing happens. The middle row goes to zero and vanishes, which means that this cluster algorithm is split. And it would actually split into an upper row, which is purely anti-automorphic. So these are the axes that are the points of the sphere. And the lower row, which is purely holomorphic. So you get two complex complement copies of, well, this, you can even see it's a thinking diagram AN. So you get two complex conjugate copies of a and 5. Remember, in Marcus' talk, you had many times a3 appearing and a2. Here's more general version of a n. And if you look at what is the space associated to the cluster algebra a n minus 5, well, it is precisely this modular space n0 n minus 2. So everything closes. I see. OK, so. Once I have that, you can ask, okay, what are the kind of functions I can write down in this space? So I say, assume now they are great integrals. Well, the singularities we said should be when two points coincide. So the natural alphabet on this space is d log xi minus xj. I can, of course, go on gauge fix, so I take n points, or gauge fix then, I use SL2 redundancy to fix the points 0, 1, infinity. Resulting set of coordinates is what is sometimes called the Fischer coordinates in M0n. And the alphabet then can easily check that this is to this. It's D logs of Ti, Ti minus D logs of 1 minus Ti's, or D logs of differences of points. The important point is that you see that it's always linear in all of these coordinates. Which means when you've got going, going to integrate this, you will always end up with polylogarithms. Because the polylogarithms are precisely t or t minus something, which are precisely the structure that we have here. Okay? So I'm not going to dwell long on multiple polyogarithms. I think many people here know, know what they are. Those who don't know are the generalization of logarithms and polyogarithms, more general kinds of differences. 
Okay, so this is naturally what you would then expect from these functions. Those are the natural functions that are written in the this space. You don't get a rational p factor from the gauge fixing. Yes, you, you do get rational functions, you will see them coming back. But those with any rational functions that are like 1 over x minus x j, they, they will come back, you will see them again. Here I'm just saying, okay, what could be the transcendental functions. Good. Now, however, this cannot be all of it because Remember, we had two color, complex complicated copies of this cluster R. Yeah? So I have to make sense out of two copies. And the two copies are actually related to unitarity, because it turns out that, that functions also have the right branch cuts come from unitarity. And it turns out that that means that these functions must be single valued iterated integrals in M0. So the drama by iterated integrals will be non single valued because I can't choose the contour with certain similarities in different ways. However, here we always end up with function of a single value. And we'll define that more precisely in the next slide. But the option is that this single representation that I've shown you before for the regular limit, so it should always give you single value iterated intervals and comes to the right This obviously is going to generalize the six point single value harmonic polylogarithm story, which simply corresponded to M04, and after gauge fixing, there's only one degree of freedom. The other singularity is at 0 and 1, and then it Okay? It also shows that in multi regular kinematics, you only expect polylogarithms, there's nothing else. So, what are the single value functions? Well, this, this next few slides are for the experts, or the polylog aficionados. Um, they are combinations of polylogs and their complex conjugate, and the branch cuts counsel between them. So you have to construct these objects. Well, it's very technical, so I'm being very brief. If you don't get this, it's not important as we talk. But basically, there's a map S that you can write down that takes a non single value of polylog and returns a combination that is single value. This map is constructed here, called polylog, or whatever. Let's look at the example. For example, this is the polylog, and I add this map S, and I get the default quality G, which is a single value analog. For example, G of the single index is G plus its complex conjugate, which is just a log of the model square, which is manifest as single value. If you want to higher weights, these combinations can be very complicated, and you can actually go and check that this result, that the function to construct in this way, will have no branch cuts. Never, ever. Yes? This should give you an idea, or at least. This should give you all, but at least all the single analogs of these G's. Hey, Zeb. Okay. Now, another technical slide, because we're done with it. Again, it's for the experts. This map has very nice properties. Actually, it preserves multiplication, preserves the functional equations among the functions. It actually commutes with single with multiple differentiations, and these functions will satisfy the same differential equations. They're not single valued analogs. There's a natural action of complex multiplication of this function, which you can write down, which relates to this S twiddle that also appeared in here. It does not commute with anti-automorphic differentiation, it's very interesting. The anti-automorphic derivative of such an object is not just what you would expect in polylogs, it's much more complicated. But that's what it is. Again, if you didn't get these two technical slides, it's important for us to talk. Just to say that we know how to construct these functions. And we know all that properties. Good. So let's go back to physics. Let's look at the machine arguments. So let's start with the master formula. So the master formula now, just in the perturbative coefficient, so we expanded everything in perturbative and so what I get is I get an insertion of the FKL eigenvalues. And remember these i's here, they the exponents of the logs so equivalent to the VFKL eigenvalues. And then I have here i's and c's which carry the list information. Then I have this complicated sum and integral, one for every cost ratio. And actually, each of them is an inverse fully valid transform, which you can define the following way. So there's something, something defined on new n space, which is fully valid space, and it returns a function defined, function of z, 
find the following way. This thing looks like this. This other thing looks like from here. Good. Just like from here in Malin, this f will take a product of functions in the Malin space and return a convolution in z space. And the convolution is defined in the following way. It's an integral of the whole complex plane of the product of two functions. Those of you who know kind of big up, this convolution looks very much similar, except that it's a full complex plane. Okay, so what can I do with this? Well, it tells me that I have a recursion in the loop number, because if I insert an additional BFPL eigenvalues, if I increase the value of one of the i's by one, that is related to the lower loop object, to convolute it with the fully valid transform of the BFPL eigenvalue, which is based on the function. I get a recursion. Okay, that's very nice. However, I need to compute this integral of the complex plane, which looks very complicated. However, it's not. Because remember that my functions, I know now they are really single value functions. So they have no branch cuts. They only have isolated singularities. So the Stokes theorem tells me that I just need to integrate over the boundaries of the partial plane, and that gives me the fact of the residues. So I just need to take the residues and the isolated singularities. I don't have to do the integral of the complex plane. Technically, you see the formula here, so this integral of the complex plane, well, this is the sum of all the residues, including infinity, obviously, of the function capital F, which is the anti-holomorphic primitive of the original function. So it's like taking the C to Z, and you first compute the anti-holomorphic primitive, and then you do the holomorphic bit using the slope sticker. That's maybe another way to see it. Okay. And you can actually show that this result is intended to primitive that we choose and so on. Good. What do I do with it? Well, I can now solve my recursion. Just by residue computation. And the recursion, of course, starts from the two loop MEG amplitude, which people have computed independently and found this nice factorization into six one objects. I know it's for that, so I now can go and increase the loop number. Okay, so. What about this factorization? Does it actually generalize? And in order to state the generalization, the answer is of course yes. Let me write this perturbative coefficient, which is labeled by powers of the BFPL eigenvalue and the listing configuration, by such a picture. It's basically a picture we had before, but I gauge fix 1, 0, and infinity. And then every phase is labeled by the, by the puncture, which is now over y, the significant coordinates. And the BFPL eigenvalue that enters the convolution integral over that value. And then I have possibilities of the output units. And what you can show is that whenever you have a phase where you don't insert the BFPL eigenvalue and it's bounded by two outcome agreements with the same elicity, you can just delete this phase. This follows from the structure of the convolution integral. This is actually not just a circuit IG, this will hold no cases. We'll come back to it. But let's focus on MHV. So what happens to MHV? Well, of course, for MHV, all the elicities here are the same. Well, there's two minuses here, and then I produce pluses, so all the output amounts of the same elicity. So that just means that I can drop all the zeros. Whenever I have strings of zeros, I just stop them. Yeah. It's a very simple statement. Delete all the, all the things that do not have to be a scale eigenvalue inserted, throw them away. Ah, what are the consequences of this? Well, first of all, of course, the number of BFPL eigenvalue insertions is related to the loop number. So, at every loop number, there's a maximum number of eigenvalues that can insert. And you can actually easily check that the L loops, and then three amplitude any MHG amplitude that L loops is determined by MHG amplitudes with up to L plus 4 lengths. <coughs> at two loops, this immediately reproduces the normal result. Okay? Because at two loops, I need up to 6 legs. At three loops, I now need, well, of course, the two loop 6 point, but also 
a new object with this one one with some sample of it. And it goes on like this. You cannot go on and say, well, I have now installed with LHP, I get the three loop six point amplitude, I get this three loop seven point object, which come in two way, two one, one two, and I get an eight point object which is one and one. And then the result is valid for arbitrary n. And you can go on like this. In particular, we went on and we computed everything on the five loops, which means nine points for the one on one. That is enough to get all MGV amplitudes of the five loops. Any number of tablets in this limit, leading your multi Okay? Any more questions? So, what about next energy? So, this was historic energy. What about next energy? Well, first, let's go back to the master form and see what changes when we go to next energy. So, there were two bits. There was the bit about the VFKL eigenvalue, which is what we discussed now extensively, that's what leads to this factorization. But then there's also the bit with the central emission blocks and the impact factors, and that's where all the listening information sits. So now we're basically going to talk about the second law. Now, if I change the helicity, let's say I start from LHV, and I flip the helicity, this is very simple in Fourier Mellon space because I have the detect devices. So, in particular, for example, Let's start with MHP and let's flip the helicity here on, on H1. So I, I write this symbolic here as chi plus, which is this bit. It is F is everything else. So I want to flip it, so I go to chi minus, because that's the only place where H1 enters up here. But now I can say, well, I just multiply and divide by chi plus, and I use the convolution theorem to get back the MHP amplitude, convoluted with an object which does not depend on all the rest. It's actually an universal object, just this one is, it's some holomorphic function which we dubbed the listed bit kernel, which is this holomorphic function here, well, we know Because that's also an anti-holomorphic cousin, which is when you flip the list in the opposite direction. Okay? Now, I showed it here for chi, but doing it on, this, on C is exactly the same. Okay, so I can now change elicities by convoluting. Convolution I can do using uh, residues. Okay, so one thing to know, to note this, is that this thing has a double pole. What does it mean? Well, remember that I first have to compute the anti-holomorphic primitive and then take the holomorphic residue. The primitive, the anti-holomorphic primitive, of course, doesn't see this bit. But when I take the residue, a double pole leads to a derivative, effectively, in, in, the, in the residue computation. So, if my MHG amplitude was pure, my next MHG amplitude will be related to the derivative of the MHG. So it will be not pure, it will have rational free factors. So that's your, your question about what about free factors. So no MHG is not pure, you see it explicitly. The other comment, I already said, the factorization theorem still holds for my MHG. The proof is actually generic. The difference is that for MHG, all the distances were the same, so I could just throw out all the zeros. But well, here, no. Here, for example, already have two loops, there's the alternating holistic configuration. There's nothing I can do about it. It just sits there. So already have two loops, I have an infinite number of building blocks. At least according to this. Now maybe there's another mechanism which we don't know, but according to this, it is an infinite number of building blocks. Still, for a given loop order holistic configuration, can I count my small maps like two loop next and HP minus and then the rest pluses, is the term by the example of just seven points, because the only place where you can insert a zero is between the minus and the plus. And all the rest, all the other zeros are just go out. If I move the minus to the second position, well, you can go through the combinatorics, but now you have an eight point object because I can insert a zero to the left of the minus and to the right of the minus. Okay. Now, if you want to sum up, Basically, what you obtain is an algorithm to construct amplitudes. You grow your own amplitude in some sense. And you do this in three operations. One is the one we just discussed, which is holistic flipping. You start with LHV and you flip the, the helicity by computing with the holistic flip curve. Then you can go and you can add particles 
is the same velocity to the left. Take this, we add two more particles to the left with the same velocities. And you know what this object is? Because factorization tells you it can go away to zeros. So you get the same function. And then you go on and then you can take this object and you can increase the loop number by computing with the second building block, which is the BFDI building. And using these operations, you can construct anything you like. And the leading block, multi energy kinematics. And we did this up to four loops in eight points. Something nice comes out of this. Namely, let's go back to the fact that normal energy energies are not pure. Let's look, for example, what happens when I convolute this elicited current. So I have minus or plus, and I can write it as a convolution of H with all plus, which is the energy. I know this is the entire of the primitive, and then the rest is just the open with this limit. Good. What you can observe is that this operation preserves the weight. Because this operation will increase, increase the weight by one, then you take a derivative, and you lower it and go back to the original weight, which is what you want, because it didn't increase the number. And this operation also produces non leading three levels. We'll come back to that. You can now ask, what then about the second operation, convolution with E, that also has a double pole, and actually you know, it's not quite true, because it actually has two simple poles, so the morphic one and the entire morphic one. So now, when you do the entire morphic primitive, that will increase the weight by one, but now the holomorphic residue will be at a simple pole, which is evaluated to the function at that point, so you do, the weight doesn't drop. So in E, convolution with E will always increase the weight, while well, flipping the list does not. Which is precisely what we would expect to happen. And here you see it mathematically arising. So, in the last few minutes, let's talk about the last building block we have not talked about, which is the leading similarities. So, leading similarities should, of course, somehow be related to the realistic configuration. Let's pick one at random. So, what are the leading similarities of this realistic configuration? Oh, what? Well, one thing that you can easily, when you think about what I told you, easily see is that. It is not the absolute heuristic configuration, it's really just the point where heuristic changes. Because that's where I want to act with my heuristic operator. Yeah. And there are, of course, two ways of doing this. You can change heuristic from plus to minus or from minus to plus. Minus to plus, you call polymorphic, plus to minus, you call anti-homomorphic. For a reason that will become clear in a, in a second. In these places, very flipped in this deep with, of course, these faces in the graph, so we call the interface. Structure. It turns out that you can prove that the rule is the leading similarities are always such that at every interface you can insert at most, so let's say an interface A with one of these spaces here, you can insert at most one cross ratio, which has this type. And with this polymorphic or anti-holomorphic, depending on whether the interface was holomorphic or anti-holomorphic. So A is the interface, and then you have a B and a C, which are two other points. What are they? The fourth point in the cross ratio is 1, which is 1. So 1 is B and C. So the ranges of B and C are restricted as follows. So let's take an R, B and C. It could be like this. So A, a would be an interface. In this case, a holomorphic one. B is somewhere to the left but not further than the next interface. While C is to the right angle. And this looks odd. Because and this, when you do the proof, it comes out of this other proof of your own, your own amplitude, which has direction. So you might think, OK, that's probably overshooting, but it's not. This comes from the fact that there are nonlinear relations among these arms. You can actually write this guy, which is, say, a nearest neighbor correlation to the left and kind of a long range correlation to the right <coughs> as something which looks mirrored, which you see the here as two, three, four, for example, can be connected to two, three, C, where C could be further to the, um, to the right. They're connected, and it's nonlinear. And because it's nonlinear, the first place where it can appear is with three interfaces. Because they're always alternate between holomorphic and anti holomorphic. And you need, say, at least two holomorphic ones, so you need at least three interfaces in total. So the first place where it appears is plus, minus, plus, minus, eight points. You do the computation, you see it is a factor. 
So you do have things that are connected. So as an example, this is the decomposition of the next, next energy 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 that take points. My plus, minus, minus, plus. So the A's and B's and C's are pure functions. And then you have the rational bits, which are these R's. And you see here the this configuration. Three is an interface, it's an anthropomorphic one. And so it can be connected to the left and to the right. That's this bit here. Then you could also connect it to five. You see this one? Then there's five in the next interface, which is holomorphic. You can connect to three to six. With this one, and then you get also quadratic bits. <coughs> the same. But now you can have more than because you can insert at most one at every point. Note that in principle you could expect also two, three, six, according to the rule that I gave you. And the same thing that you see interfaces for this long range thing for you. That's why it doesn't. Okay. Good. So, one last thing about these leading similarities. The structure of this RBAC is actually not arbitrary. So, this is to think that you can insert a given interface to build up your leading similarities. And, well, you see it between zeros and poles, actually. So, what are they? Well, first of all, you can notice that since B is always to the left and C is always to the right, this thing is never a pole, never a soft pole. Soft poles correspond to the situation where two neighboring points become equal. This thing has a pole when xA becomes x1, which is not a soft singularity, or when B is equal to C, but A is in between, so this is not a soft singularity either. But then it's good, because you can imagine that things become soft, well, this does happen, if there was a singularity associated to that, somewhere in the denominator, the way it would talk. It would be true. So this thing cannot have a pole at places where um, the soft singularity, and it doesn't. But maybe it could, but then it would need some conspiracy. But naturally, it doesn't happen. The weight remains the same when you take the soft level. The next thing you can now ask is, okay, but let's say you start from the next energy amplitude, which is not pure. And I make the negative velocity be more soft, so it becomes energy, which is pure. So what happens to the rational factors? So this is, for example, the next energy amplitude is plus minus plus. If you make the negative velocity be more soft, you can easily check that the R's all go to zero and one. So this, the zeros of this function, and also the one, the numerator structure, you can count what happens when interfaces disappear, because you make the one soft. Interface disappear in this limit, the R squared to 0 and 1. So the leading similarities rearrange themselves to give you leading similarities with your interfaces. Okay, good. I think that's pretty much it. So, one of the main messages I think is this. So this is kind of the geometry of algebraic kinematics. <coughs> I only look at leading log, but Dramatic picture, at least I believe, should be pretty much all of us and we call it to hold beyond the log. And once you have that, you can look at the consequences. And we start amplitudes with the convolutions, that's by leading similarities. But you can also ask, what else can I do? Well, of course, the obvious question is to go beyond the log. And for example, then we talked this morning about the central recognition block, which so far was only known leading order. If you know it beyond leading order, you can also compute next to leading order amplitudes. And there's also a question that Ben also mentioned, is the Martin Redden Ball State Exchange, which one would need to understand. And the other question I can ask is what about other cases where you can kind of control the geometry. And if just the algebra becomes a finite type, you can describe the functions. Could you also could there be other limits where you actually can completely describe the space of functions and try to find some recursive structure? Okay, so that's pretty much it. And I just want to end with some publicity. It's uh, about the fourth edition of the Atrani School, some of you probably have been in the past. This time it will be less about amplitudes and previous editions, but this will be more focused on mitigability and conformal field theories. In particular, there's also a lecture by Dr. Schomer was on EFPL, if 
few words like in BF, BFB about this talk. And so if you're interested in this topic, then just go to the website which you find here and sign up for the school. Thank you very much. question, just that another area where we have some control over things, another place where you develop singularities in a physical region is this self-crossing limit, but you could imagine trying to work out function spaces for that too. Yes. And more general than the six-point case, which yes. is the only one that's really been explored so far. Yeah, so that would be one of these cases where you might hope to control Any more questions or comments? Thank you again, uh,